Good morning from the Asia Pacific. It's 9 a.m. here in Hong Kong, in Beijing, and in Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets China Open. I'm David Inglis. Let's get to your top stories today. The Japanese economy unexpectedly slipped into a recession, clouding the central bank's path towards ending negative interest rates. And also ahead, stocks across the region modestly higher following this rally on Wall Street. Robust earnings helping overcome concerns about persistent inflation. And I'm Haslinda Amin in Jakarta, where Prabowo Subianto has declared victory in Indonesia's presidential election. The former general accused of human rights abuses now calling for national unity. Yep, and Jakarta comes online market-wise in about an hour from now. Also takes us back to just reminding our viewers that only one market remains shut in the region. That's uh, the mainland, mainland Chinese markets. All that being said, the price action of effectively most of the China proxies out there are pointing to uh, a rally when this market opens up, assuming nothing changes from today to tomorrow. A lot could happen. <laughs> two, still, uh, two full trading days left. That being said, of course, reason I mentioned that is that just a massive move up in the Golden Dragon Index up overnight. So this might actually go into the tailwinds going into today. You have, of course, this rally on Wall Street. You have this uh, on the specific uh, benchmark on the NASDAQ as well. A50 futures coming online over in Singapore, which, by the way, released GDP numbers. Lots to unpack in Singapore and in Japan in just a moment. There are mild bounce across markets in the Asia-Pacific. A pullback, as you can see on your screens, on A50 futures. Uh, Japan is back. Well, not Japan is back. Nikkei is back, to be more specific. Okay, we have to be more granular here. Back above 38,000. That then puts us about 3%, give or take, from all-time highs. We'll talk about the economy in just a moment, their unexpected contraction in the final three months of, uh, of 2023, so two straight now. Taiwan is coming back online, so there's an element of catch up there. It's been shut, of course, for several days, 3.3% uh, to the upside in, in Taiwan. Uh, interesting, a lot of news flow coming out of that last market you see on your screen to Australia. See so you jobs numbers coming out, the RBA also speaking as well. Uh, they're talking about, well, uh, well, well let's, let me start up with the RBA, of course, that's coming in. Uh, effectively talking about how you know the the path of rates outside Australia will have an impact on when and what they can do inside Australia as far as monetary policy is concerned. Now, all that being said, when you look at the domestic numbers coming through and the jobs numbers, which came through about 30 minutes back, does indicate that they might need to move sooner. That's certainly what the market is doing right now with this pullback we're seeing uh, in, in the Aussie dollar. 481 jobs created in January. There are more people on my flight coming back than the Australian economy created jobs in the whole month. Of course, that's a very uh, difficult, of course, economic indicator to, to track in any case, of course. Okay, U.S. curve comes down to this. We're lower today. We were lower overnight. We're still, though, as far as the entire curve is concerned, um, above, way above level still uh, before the CPI print came out. In terms of just pricing on uh, you know, where the Fed is going to be, so the Fed's told us three. Market started out the year at seven cuts. We've now closed that gap to about one rate cut. So it's three to four out of the market based on current pricing as we speak. Okay, let's talk more about Japan. Have a look at this chart. Two straight quarters of contraction there in the Japanese economy. What does the BOJ do now with its information? And what actually led actually to, to this pullback, unexpected pullback? in growth and the contraction you see minor one but of course technical recession there you have two straight quarters let's well let's bring in uh, uh, Peter Jackson of course he's with us and Paul Jackson um, uh, our Japan economy and government editor uh, out of Tokyo well Paul let's I guess we, we can talk about policy implications uh, in a couple of minutes but I want to talk to you about what what led to this pullback because it seems that this caught economists off guard uh, hey, look, I think uh, this is a sign that inflation really is uh, grinding on the, uh, on the economy and on uh, both households and businesses um, have been cutting spending in real terms 
uh, for three quarters in a, in a row. Uh, this doesn't point to a positive growth cycle that the Bank of Japan is looking for uh, as it uh, prepares the ground for raising interest rates for the first time since uh, 2007. So this is a, a, a bad result for uh, policymakers. This really is the perfect headache for the Bank of Japan. Can we still assume, to your point, Paul, that they, it, it's still all systems go in terms of, I think there's a, you, you hit the nail on the head there, there's a nuance uh, that's, that's important to mark between normalizing policy and actually tightening policy. Yeah, sure. And I think if you if you look at the remarks from uh, Bank of Japan uh, board members and from the top brass, including uh, the governor Ueda and his uh, deputy Uchida, uh, you'll you'll have heard that uh, they're talking about uh, scrapping the negative interest rate in terms of, hey, don't worry, it's not going to be that bad, and it's still going to be very supportive of the economy, very accommodative, <laughs> yeah. which uh, suggesting that it's still a kind of form of easing. We're still we're still helping the economy. I mean, in real terms, interest rates are still negative. That's the kind of thing, the messaging that they've been giving, and I think they're going to have to ramp up that uh, talk if they can, if they want to go ahead with this rate hike in in, in March or April. Yeah, there are really different ways to spin this, don't we, Paul? Paul, Paul? Paul, thank you so much. Paul Jackson there in Japan for us, our Japan economy uh, and government editor there. J uh, just to mark as well, Taro Kimura, our senior economist for uh, Bloomberg Economics, also thinks the GDP surprise recession will give the BOJ pause for now. That reaction on your Bloomberg terminals for you. Also on your terminals, you probably saw this. So after being shut for the better part of the last two weeks, or so this market last traded just keep this in mind when I'm talking about Taiwan here last traded 10 days ago so you take take the move you split that over the days it was shot we're up three percent on the TIEX index we're up nine percent last I checked eight percent on TSMC all of that being said as well at 18.6 that's an intraday that's an intraday high record high as far as this goes we'll see where we end that at 18,615 on the TIEX index. All right, it seems that this rally is moving quite a bit. You guys see that AI rally overnight. Things are going, going vertical there. Okay, let's bring in uh, Thomas Pulowek, head of APAC Multi-Asset Solutions at Tiro Price, joining us out of hot and humid Singapore this morning. Thomas, good morning and thanks for coming on the show. Let's, I was wondering if I could start off with the, your thoughts on where this bull market in, in the U.S. equity market is at the moment and your assessment there. and. Just some of the names across the AI space are just going vertical. What's your sense of where we are in that story? Yeah, hi Dave. Um, thanks for having me. So, just on um, on the market uh, reaction, we have seen uh, still a, a sensitivity to uh, macroeconomic data like inflation, but the rebound uh, yesterday shows that the earnings uh, power is stronger, and especially as you uh, as you highlighted, uh, the magnificent seven maybe uh, without Tesla uh, generated a lot of uh, surprise in their earnings and positive surprise. So we can see that. Continuing, and we are uh, still um, cautiously optimistic about the uh, the uh, AI uh, sector in the future. Right, and you, you mentioned in inflation, and you know, recent inflation data has been, I mean, noisy, very hot in the U.S. We had the print out of the U.K. yesterday, very cold, following very hot numbers the previous month. There, how do you suppose investors should be looking at this this series of inflation reports coming through? Should we look through the noise? Or is there something material there that might indicate a shift in the narrative? Yeah, for us, it has been always um, trying to build a portfolio that is diversified and robust enough to not only navigate that um, recessionary right. risk last year and now more of a, an upgrade in, uh, in growth outlook, but now also inflation risk. We, we have always been uh, telling our clients that it's very rare for inflation to only come with one wave. Typically, you have multiple waves <laughs> yeah. of inflation. And uh, what we have seen in our uh, data is that um, last year we could see inflation rebounding. So that was an early sign for us to uh, look at um, inflation sensitive assets like real assets or uh, even um, inflation linked bond with a short term maturity.
Yeah, in fact, you have added to U.S. tips. Tell us about that. When did you guys build those positions? Uh, we added that at the uh, very end of 2023, as we were uh, seeing some of our early indicator of inflation moving higher. And again, we don't necessarily want to add to, um, to duration risk, but we, we thought that uh, the short-term tips at that time were fairly priced because uh, a lot of people were looking at a disinflationary environment and immaculate uh, soft landing. So I think it will be a bit bumpier, <laughs> but uh, definitely having a robust portfolio that will have uh, some inflation protection also uh, will be good to have. And g given the fact that it, it seems for now, based on the data we have, a soft landing is on the way. You know, markets have closed the gap on expectations and rate hikes. We've gone from six to seven to closer to three, where you know, the Fed has guided these markets as well. What does it mean for duration strategy? Do you are you short duration? Do you, is it time to move away from that? Just your thoughts on that. Uh, so as um, macro investors, we are not too tactical on, uh, on our duration call. We let our uh, fixed income experts to, uh, to do that on a, on a more timely manner. But uh, definitely we still have uh, a negative duration position relative to our uh, benchmark. So uh, we will be short uh, government bonds, um, investment grade. And at the opposite, we are quite uh, overweight in high yield or even in emerging market debt, where we see the, the carry uh, be, being beneficial. We see also in emerging market really inflation uh, going down uh, in a more um, a stable way and allowing central banks to uh, already cut interest rates. So that should benefit more this sector. So in fixed income is more higher yields for now to um, enjoy the, the carry and um, reduce the duration for sovereign uh, developed bonds. And, you know, that goes into your, your overweight in Asia credit. And I got to say, though, those, those spreads, Thomas, look extremely tight already. Just give us your thoughts there. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, uh, good comment, and uh, a lot of our uh, investors are asking the, the same question. But uh, to me, it's, a, it's an environment where you want to uh, be exposed to risk, but uh, control your downs downside. And uh, as I said before, there are some reasons to see uh, yields moving lower, especially in Asia, and that should benefit uh, the total yield of these instruments. But also, I'm not too concerned about uh, leverage or risk uh, outside the China. Chinese property sector, and in that case, uh, Asia credit is quite uh, well diversified and with robust fundamentals that should uh, pay well in a, a normal carry environment. And Thomas, we just talked about Japan and the recession that it unexpectedly entered before we, we brought you in. I know you guys have reduced your overweight in Japan. Tell us why. Yeah, so it was a bit of a, a profit taking. Uh, we are still constructive on, uh, on Japan. Japan is quite of a, a unique place where you have, uh, as you, uh, Paul just said before, um, still a, um, a accommodative uh, monetary stance. You have reflationary that is having an immediate impact, as we have seen in reduced consumption for uh, the GDP print. But uh, it's an economy that is healing towards a more uh, positive inflation environment. And last but not least, you have have the corporate governance that is definitely uh, pushing a better return on equity for shareholders. So coupled to that, you have also some um, flows coming from outside Japan, especially coming from China that has been supporting uh, the market in January. So that for us, that was a time to reflect on that overweight position that we have had for more than a year and to start to uh, reduce uh, that overweight. But we could go back, especially in an environment of a weaker yen that could continue to, to support uh, the market going forward. In the meantime, though, you, you've taken that overweight. W what are you funding with that reduction? Where are you taking that? So uh, what we have been upgrading recently is that, um, as uh, I mentioned before, we have clearer indicators that the uh, GD GDP is reaccelerating, especially in the US uh, and uh, tentatively in some part of Europe. So uh, with that, uh, we think that uh, cyclical um, stocks could do better. So value, which was um, um, an area we, we were neutral or slightly underweight, we added to uh, the value sector. But also in Asia, we found uh, that 
like Korea, for example, Korea is exposed to AI. Korea is also exposed to uh, cyclical um, upgrade. And uh, you also have the rumor of corporate governance improvement in Korea that is following Japan. So uh, we wanted to buy the rumor uh, in, at that time. So that was also an area where we added a position. Thomas, outside of Bitcoin, I think we covered the world there. Thank you so much, Thomas Pulowek there. Thank you uh, for joining us today out of uh, Singapore, head of multi-asset solutions, APAC at T-Ro Price. Right, uh, coming up, we're live out of Jakarta, the Indonesian capital. There we go, and live pictures coming through after Defense Minister Prabowo Subianto declares victory in presidential elections, also counting down to the open of trade under 15 minutes away, and perhaps a rally in the offing, question mark. Futures are pointing down, though. The opening bell is next. This is Bloomberg Markets, China Open. Right, welcome back to shows. ETFs tracking... Indonesia, in this case, it's the iShares MSCI one overnight, 2.5%, arguably first reaction to elections in Indonesia. The cash market, of course, reopens in about 40 minutes from now. In fact, let's get straight to Jakarta. Our chief international correspondent for Southeast Asia, Linda Amin, is there for us to talk us through what a week it's been. Has. Well, what a day it was yesterday. I mean, uh, when it comes to that quick count, uh, it does show that Prabowo has about 60% of the votes. And this is pretty stunning. What a turnaround for the man who tried to be the president uh, two times before and failed. But here he is with a majority of the vote. It talks to, you know, how successful his media strategy has been, in particular TikTok, where he has managed to remake himself from uh, a general who was linked to the killings in Papua New Guinea as well as East Timor, the abductions of student protesters to someone seen as a cuddly grandfather. Take a look at his meme on TikTok. It is this chubby, uh, cuddly grandfather. And that's one of the hearts and minds of the younger population. 50% of uh, the voters are under 40 years old with no memory of what he did or allegedly did. So he has won that part of the vote. It also shows how uh, Jokowi has played a massive role. Now, this is a president who, in his final year, still maintains a high rating in access of 80 percent. And some say that that has tr translated to more than 20 percent of Prabowo's own vote. So it's all worked for Prabowo. Now, in terms of uh, his victory speech last night, he gave thanks to a slew of people, leaders of old leaders who are currently uh, in place, but he kind of generated the biggest reaction when he thanked uh, Joko Widodo for his role uh, for the win. Okay, well, all, all that considered, to talk us through some of the conversations you've had so far and the ones coming up to help us unpack really the, you know, what, what this means for global markets and why should we care. And, and if you take a look at the reaction from the uh, rupiah just yesterday, it strengthened half a percent. It talks uh, about policy continuity, and that's exactly what our commentators have been saying as well. It shows that Prabowo will continue the policies of Joko Widodo. That means uh, downstreaming. That means infrastructure building. That means moving the capital from Jakarta to Nusantara. All good for the economy, but the challenge really is, you know, ramping up uh, all the changes and the reforms. Uh, one thing to note as well, you know, it's been very peaceful. There has been no reports of any violence, any incidents. And we've had the two contenders, Anis as well as Ganja. Uh, while they have not conceded, they have also asked their supporters to remain calm. And I think that is the difference when you take a look and compare it to past elections where, you know, there was always that, that tension after the election. But take a look around. Take a look at the roundabout just behind me. It is business as usual and that bodes well for the country dave has great stuff as linda i'm in there in jakarta for us our chief international correspondent for southeast asia now speaking of elections here our m live question of the day we're posting of course to all of you guys and do share your thoughts with us uh and well it, do elections represent risk 
or are they an opportunity? I guess the Chinese word is effectively both really for crisis and opportunity. But in any case, of course, do email in. Uh, well, for our clients, you can check that out, of course, and you know how to reach us. And of course, for everyone else, markets live, one word, at Bloomberg.net. Right, uh, some other stories we're tracking from around the world at this point in time. Uh, police in India fired tear gas at Punjab, Haryana. Uh, at the Haryana border here, as thousands of farmers tried to march in the capital, New Delhi, to protest against cost pressures. An organizer says around 25,000 tractors have been gathered and more are expected to arrive. The farmers are demanding guaranteed crop prices and debt relief. The protest is a political headache for the Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, that's ahead of elections in a couple of weeks. Now, Israel has pulled out of talks on securing a ceasefire with Hamas, refusing to send a delegation back to Cairo for further discussions. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu again dismissed the militant group's demands as delusional. Israel's position suggests that even a temporary ceasefire remains far off as fears grow about more than one million Palestine, Palestinian refugees sheltering in the southern Gaza city of Rafah. Meanwhile, the tensions between Israel and Hezbollah have intensified after Israeli towns and an army base came under attack. The barrage of missiles uh, blamed on Hezbollah fighters based in Lebanon prompted Israel fighter jets to launch extensive strikes on Iran-backed group's positions. And some Israeli politicians, including cabinet members, have been calling for more aggressive action against Hezbollah. Right, um, just under seven minutes to the opening bell here in Hong Kong, and that's the setup as we approach the opening bell. Seven minutes away, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, before we get to a preview of the day ahead here, just uh, to note here, one stock in Tokyo, Rakuten, up daily limit, 16% uh, there. This is an earnings story. We'll unpack this even further a bit later on. But uh, suffice to say, this really has been the driving force across these different parts of this Japanese equity market, which are, and we'll talk more about some of these other stocks moving. But there you go, Rakuten, 16% to the upside. Right, maybe going the opposite way and perhaps going the opposite way. There we go. We are on track for a weaker open this Thursday morning. Now, keep in mind, as we flip the page here, we did close higher for the day yesterday, quite a reversal. In fact, we opened lower, reversed, reversed everything, and then closed higher. So over the last two days or so, we're still higher, though, from that reopen. In terms of the agenda today, it's still fairly quiet. No Stock Connect, no mainland China, no onshore equities, no no renminbi fix. Perhaps a pullback on the HSI vol gauge, which actually spiked three percentage points yesterday. So the, in terms of the upside here, 50-day moving averages may test that as well. And Ping, I will talk more about that, that cut coming out of CLSA. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. So I'm losing track. It is, what day is it? What? Thursday, Thursday. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. You know what? You know, I, we're returning from work midweek. That's what it does. You look at the weekend, your, your brain's on Monday, and this is what things happen. Anyway, okay, so I, I guess I'm still in vacation mode. Um, so we're at 25 seconds to the opening bell. Okay, I'm losing track of thought here. The last headline I wrote, and here's why. So we were looking at some breaking numbers coming through, right? Singapore GDP miss, Japan falling into recession unexpectedly, and that jobs report out of Australia, 481 jobs. I was talking about this, so my brain is still in vacation mode. There are more people on my flight coming back to Hong Kong than the Australian economy created jobs. I'm, of course, exaggerating, but yeah, 481. Not a labor or less. There we go. Uh, but we're looking at a pullback across these markets, and we'll talk more about certainly the recovery, because this is how we started yesterday. This is not how we ended the day uh, across these markets. MSCI China, a fifth, well, a tenth of one percent to the downside right now. Uh, currency markets, uh, we don't have onshore China yet. Dollar China, uh, we're still hovering 
I think it's the, okay, let me just check that as we flip the page. We're still hovering above this, the, the, this key moving average, which we breached to the upside, and we're just sort of settling above that level right now. It's the 100-day at 722.18. 61, as you can see on dollar China, HS Vol Index is pulling back a little bit. We were up three points yesterday. And maybe good news for some, some borrowers out there where at 4.5%, your high bore is relatively at, what, five-month lows? But still substantially higher than maybe when you first took out that mortgage. Anyway, uh, May Tuan was a big mover yesterday on spending data coming through. Uh, during the Lunar New Year, May 20 is still up today. Xpeng was uh, substantially up yesterday, pulling back ever so slightly. So we're looking at some of these big tech stocks, Alibaba, JD.com, 13F filings out overnight. Yep, backward looking, but it does indicate, of course, intention. And Ping On Insurance, CLSA, taking the cleaver out, cutting the stock to reduce. Price target, 31 bucks. That's about 230. So that's about an 8% 8, 8 downside, give or take. I'm just doing the math in my head right now. Okay, let's talk about markets as we get underway today, what it means for the short-term outlook. Joining us here in set is our stocks reporter for the Asia-Pacific, Jeannie Yu. So yesterday was curious because we were, we were looking at losses, and then I went away to lunch, I came back, and we were higher at the end. What happened? Yeah, I, actually, I was a little bit surprised as well. Yeah. Um, I guess on the one hand, the market was really, um, um, they're waiting for the China-Asia open next week so on the one hand there is still some policy hopes in the market and then on the other hand i think some of the people who were underway china so much um they were looking for some early indicators you know in terms of spending during the vacation whether there is um, some early signs that you know things are stabilizing a bit and uh, um, things are bottoming out from here so we were seeing um for example like macau casinos yep. the number of visitors they were up like more than 30 percent uh, and also we were seeing some news about the traffic in China, you know, how it has recovered to the pre-COVID levels. So all of these are pointing to signs that, you know, there are some there are some areas in the, in, in the economy that's showing some signs of, you know, bottoming out. So I guess that's bringing some investors uh, some relief. Um, remember, the market is already down 60% from their high. So mm. it's um, pretty cheap. So any positive news can lead to a uh, very strong um, rebound, uh, you know, from this uh, very depressed uh, valuation at this moment. Has it changed the overall view, though? That um, has it removed this risk premium that this, you know, just calcified around this market? Yeah, when we talk to investors, I think especially those long-only investors, yeah. they are still really, really cautious and they're not really really looking to get back to the market anytime soon though like although like they, they are having a lot of difficulty to find enough of, uh, investment opportunities elsewhere to fill the their underway positions in china but still like i think they're still in a wait and see mo moment and then um like let's see what, how china a react next week and uh, how those um, measures we were expecting before the Lunar New Year holiday, how that's going to be unfolded, you know, um, after, after the long holiday. Jeannie, thank you so much. And as we were just talking there, surprise, surprise, the Hang Seng Index is now up for the day where we're about four minutes in. So let's, let's give it some time. There we go. Um, to the point that Jeannie was just making there, right? Some of the sort of early data suggests that there, you know, there has been a pickup in spending and travel activity during uh, the holiday period. Let's bring in Jing Liu, Greater China Chief Economist at HSBC Global Research. Good morning and nice to see you and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So let's talk about that. What, have you seen any strong data that suggests that there had been a pickup? There has, there has been, sorry, present tense, a, a pickup in spending, travel, what have you? Yes, indeed. I think uh, the passenger trips this year mm. will probably hit a record high. Now the official estimates seem to point to 9 billion passenger trips this year. And also in terms of the box office revenue, uh, just uh, four days of the holiday already see uh, 5 billion mm. B. That's quite strong. So um, they even create a new phrase to describe the crowds. What's the phrase? It's uh, 人重重, okay. uh, one Fanisha. person, two persons, three persons, just, just describe okay. everywhere you see people. Okay, yeah, that, that's certainly the case as well at the airport, right here coming back as well, and around the, the streets of Hong Kong. Now, okay, so this is, it's a holiday period. Now, can we read anything from this that might indicate sort of a longer-term sustainable path for the consumer? 
Yeah, I think there's some peculiarity about this uh, spring festival. Mm. This is the first fully normalized uh, spring festival since uh, 2019. Mm. So lots of pent up demand here. Mm. But at the same time, we also see some new uh, spending pattern. Uh, normally people go back home for the spring festival, but this year, because we have uh, eight days holiday in China, people go home and then start traveling. Mm. Uh, so in some uh, uh, countries which have the visa free entry for China, such as uh, Malaysia, uh, uh, you know, Thailand, uh, Thailand yep. Singapore, they all see uh, influx of Chinese visitors and within China everywhere, uh, people seem to uh, travel a lot. Okay, let's, let's talk about some of the data that's come through so far. So I think PMI numbers for January, uh, the credit numbers exploded for January. Now, is there anything that we should take away from that, from, from those numbers? I think the uh, January credit number is very interesting, not okay. just because it beats the uh, market consensus, but also in terms of the structure. We mm. see that it's no longer purely driven by the government bond issuance. Uh, mm. We see the pickup on both the household uh, credit demand as well as the um, the corporate. I think mm. uh, the um, starting from the late last year, there's uh, uh, definitely a step up on the policy support. Mm. We see um, that probably uh, play a role in this uh, strong credit data. And you know, they've delivered a an earlier than expected triple R cut. Do you see more? From, from the PBOC as far as monetary policy. And then we'll talk about fiscal policy later on. Right. So we actually see uh, in the second half of this year, uh, 20 basis point of the rate cut uh, mm. from the MLF rate. But the LPR rate cut could come earlier than that because the Governor Penn already gave us a heads up at the same meeting when he announced uh, the triple R cut. Mm. And on top of that, we also see this PSL, 500 billion already, mm. a net injection. That could continue to come to support the so-called three projects uh, in order to stabilize the housing market. Okay, well, so that takes us into fiscal fiscal policy and things like bond issuance, for example. The NPC is coming up, and the crucial number there is the, well, the budget deficit target. So, so what are your expectations there, and should we, should we get excited? I think um, actually we prefer to look at this broadly defined uh, deficit, which actually okay. combine both the general budget account and also another account, government uh, uh, managed funds. This is where the issuance of special bonds as well as uh, okay. land sales come into. So combined together, we think the deficit would be 8% of the GDP mm. comparable to last year. And last year was the uh, second highest, uh, just uh, trailing the 2020s uh, mm. deficit number. So I think the fiscal policy will continue to be proactive and this year probably we'll see more spending by central government in particular. So 8% total deficit if you include everything else, so central government plus special, you talked about a reduction in interest rates even further, will those, those two things be enough to get us, to get inflation going? That, that's a key question for markets too. I think actually so far we see the drag, the major drag uh, seem to come from the housing market. So mm. it's very encouraging to see the government start to step up the support on the housing market. Uh, I think the new model to segregate uh, the so-called commodity housing market, private housing indeed, and then the uh, social housing seem to be a good uh, ma uh, model, promising model, in a sense that the social housing uh, can also help to absorb the oversupply on the commodity housing market. So for our viewers that are just hearing about that, that's interesting. If you could talk, so what is that program exactly? So uh, they were talking about uh, the three projects, uh, you know, uh, different names, but the target is to increase the total number of the social housing supply. Actually, uh, as of now, probably less than 20% of the uh, population live in the social housing. Mm. So there's a, a lot of room uh, for improvement. And that could include both the construction from scratch and also uh, purchasing some of the oversupply apply from the commodity housing market and convert that into social housing. Okay, so, so best, best case scenario for the housing market this year? So we actually see the stabilization in a sense that uh, property investment probably will come flat this year. Uh, in the previous two years, we see the contraction. Very quickly, as a final question here, do you think stabilizing the stock market should become an economic objective? 
Well, I think you know the recent uh, policy changes seem to point to uh, the importance on the stock market, mm. and we see the change of the CSRC chairman, many other uh, initiatives. So I think this probably uh, at least rising the priority. Okay, Jing Liu, thank you so much. Xinyan Kuai Le. Xinyan Kuai Le. All right, Greater China Chief Economist, HSBC Global Research. Thank you so much. A quick glance at movers across these markets. APAC wide. I mean, Renaissance is a big one, of course. They're looking at one specific stock in Australia. 28%, you see that on your screens. Quite a premium there. 9 billion Aussie, I believe, was the worth of that transaction there. Rakuten, we talked about that limit up. That's an earnings story. And TSMC is coming back online along with the entire Taiwanese stock market. Last rated Feb 5, 10 days ago, split the difference. You get a daily move there. Right, it's about 10 minutes into the session. We're looking at Hong Kong. Flip the page, please, if we can. Hang Seng Index, developers, HS Tech. And there we go. We've now flipped back underwater. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Right, 42 minutes into the year of the dragon, Taiwanese stock market, 2.6% to the upside, 18,566 is a level that we've seen never. So if we remain at these levels, we will be closing at an all-time high on the specific benchmark, right? This might even go into this sort of broader theme that everyone is talking about on Wall Street and just this unstoppable, insane... I mean, name your adjective rally that's taking place across U.S. AI frenzy lifting tech stocks yet again. I mean, NVIDIA scorching rally there that's boosted the market value to back above Alphabet. It crossed Amazon just this week as well. Avril Hong is with us out of Singapore to help us unpack the story. So NVIDIA has now overtaken some of those traditional tech darlings, Avril. Absolutely, David. I mean, as you say, you can choose your adjective. Blistering, scorching rally on NVIDIA. This year alone, it's risen almost 50%. There seems to be this insatiable appetite for the processes used in the data centers to power these complex calculations required for AI applications. And NVIDIA, its performance overnight has helped it to a market cap of about $1.83 trillion, eclipsing Alphabet just the day after it overtook Amazon in market cap. Flip the board. I want to show you how it's faring globally. At 1.83 trillion, it is sitting just behind Saudi Aramco at $2 trillion. It's really become this investor freight favorite amid the AI frenzy. And I guess it's worth discussing why uh, and what sets it apart, I suppose, is ability to demonstrate revenue growth amid the AI frenzy. And we recently also got a glimpse into its investor investment strategy. Uh, it's disclosed its stake in ARM, which not so long ago it was trying to acquire, as well as SoundHound. This is a company that makes uh, the AI audio recognition software. And this month alone, NVIDIA has had at least five brokers uh, upgrade their price target for the stock. So the earnings next week are going to be absolutely key to watch for where we go from here with NVIDIA stock. Yeah, I mean, this company better deliver something, nothing short of outstanding, hopefully. April, I mean, this, this boom and this rally has, has made some of the world's richest even, even wealthier, I, I imagine. Absolutely. Uh, and among them, the co-founder of NVIDIA, Jensen Huang, uh, he's had about $20 billion added to his wealth this year, but it's not just him. His distant cousin, Lisa Su, uh, also a lot of wealth added there, now a billionaire, and she's, of course, uh, the CEO of AMD. And on top of that, we also have the super micro uh, computers co-founder, Charles Liang. His wealth has tripled uh, this year, and indeed, 
if you look at the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, almost all the wealth that's been added this year can be traced back in some way, shape or form to artificial intelligence. But worth noting here, if you take a look at Super Micro and how its stock has surged uh, this year, by the way, coinciding with a lot of the social media chatter around the company, the relative strength index, that shows us that it is well into overbought levels. And of course, amid this AI frenzy, we can't all be winners. Uh, so it's worth talking about Michael Berry, you know, the money manager that was made famous by the book The Big Short. Uh, he actually offloaded a stake and had to uh, unwind this bet against some of these high-flying uh, chip companies via the iShares Semiconductor ETF. Uh, and he actually mm. scooped up stocks in health and tech companies and boosted uh, his positions in Alibaba as well as JD.com. David. Yeah, that's interesting, right? There's 13 F filings, what happened after what those filings suggested they did as of the end of last year and maybe did they miss it did they did they take the right call and not time this april thank you so much april hong there unpacking quite a complex story and just everyone is talking about this really super microcomputer blows everyone's mind okay well april was talking about this right so michael burry 13f filings top holding now is alibaba there we go all right some other stories that we're tracking uh, across the world right now, Uber uh, jumping to most in 18 months after announcing it will buy back as much as $7 billion in shares here. Now, the move comes after the ride-hailing Pioneer reported its first full year of operating profit and consistently positive free cash flow. The CFO says that a repurchase plan is a vote of confidence in Uber's financial momentum. Now, Cisco has announced plans to cut thousands of jobs after a slowdown and corporate tech spending wiped out its sales growth. A restructuring plan will roughly uh, affect 5% uh, of the firm's workforce, which would mean about 4,000 jobs. Cisco's third quarter prof, uh, forecast fell far short of Wall Street estimates, sending the stock, as you can see on your screens, lower in late trade north of 5%. Okay, here's the, here's the other big story and an update here. So what happened with Lyft, right? My bad. So the CEO, David Risher, has taken the blame for a typo that unintentionally inflated the company's earnings outlook and sent shares soaring. On Tuesday, the firm's press release initially said its margin would expand by 500 basis points instead of 50 basis points. Now, Risher told Bloomberg the Lyft team was taking the error seriously. Well, look, first of all, it's on me. There are a lot of eyes on this press release, but at the end of the day, uh, my bad. But look, I don't want it to take anything away from the butt-kicking performance that the business did, um, thanks to all of our employees and thanks to millions of drivers. I mean, look, we had our, our financially strongest quarter we've ever had, uh, and I'm super excited about it. There you go. The Lyft CEO speaking with us earlier, a couple of hours back on Bloomberg Television. All right, uh, we'll be back. Don't go away. We'll leave you with a look at markets here in Hong Kong. This is Bloomberg. Some of the stocks we're tracking here, so we talked about this a few minutes back. So 13F filings out, Alibaba not a top holding of Michael Burry, uh, JD.com also. So effectively, they them adding exposure to Chinese tech. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, TSMC, 700 bucks, 7.5%. If you're surprised by that number, keep in mind this market's been shut for 10, about 10 days or so, calendar days, and it's resumed trade today. All that considered, of course, we're at a record high on the index itself, the TIEX index, we're lower and slightly weaker here on the developers index, Chinese developer index, about, down about 2%. Okay, um, other things we're tracking today, you know, it's been, it's been busy on the economic data front. You know, we woke up this morning to another inflation shocker, this time out of the UK, which came out in the afternoon. So if you slept early, you would wake up to that. We do sleep early here, right? I'm in bed by 7. Um, so we woke up this morning on, well, as far as cable is concerned, we've recovered back above this key moving average. We're sitting just on top of that uh, on your chart. A couple of other things. Singapore GDP out about two hours back, missing estimates there, although the forecast for the year 
1 to 3 percent remaining unchanged. That's number two. Number three, comments coming out of the RBA earlier on talking about how policy outside, monetary policy outside, will affect what they do inside. And going into that, that again, and just a caveat as well, the jobs report out of Australia is always very difficult to predict. There's always a lot of variance, part, full-time participation rate, employment rate. Uh, the number that caught my eye, and you guys might have seen this too, 481 jobs, not 1,000, not 100, 481 jobs were created. That's quite a miss there. Uh, we did see, of course, some weakness coming through in the Aussie dollar, maybe some repricing and some repositioning there around expectations of when the RBA might actually be able to move, which still remains, by the way, I should mention, a second half story. And of course, the other one was Japan, unexpectedly reporting a contraction last three months of 2023, which effectively means that Japan is in a technical recession. Okay, all your eco numbers out right now. And just to mention, in Southeast Asia, the Philippines rate decision meeting was yesterday. The decision is announced later today. And as far as Indonesia goes and Southeast Asia, our live coverage continues out of Indonesia. And we'll be speaking with a lot of guests coming through, including the campaign team of Mr. Prabo and the former Indonesian trade minister. All these, as you can see, coming up on your screens at this time in a couple of minutes as well. There, there we go. Um, so stay tuned for that. And of course, do stay tuned for the market reopen in Jakarta. A couple of minutes away from that, just over five minutes away. Uh, and if some of these moves in the ETF market are any indication, so you had a move up of 2.5% overnight. iShares MSCI Indonesia. We could see a pop at the open in Jakarta today, just over five minutes away. So we're, our continuing coverage of elections, plus all the big macro stories and all the big micro and earnings stories coming out of Japan. There's plenty more ahead. Thanks for joining us this hour. This is Bloomberg.